God wants you to be rich. Am I right or am I wrong? God wants you to be wealthy. Is money evil though? Well, according to King Solomon, another meaningless task that he's seen in his life is just that, chasing wealth. But oh, wait one second. Isn't King Solomon known as the wisest and richest king who ever lived? So why is he saying that chasing money and going out there in pursuit of financial freedom and independence is all meaningless? So welcome to another episode of the Wealth and Wisdom series. Here we are in episode six. We're unpacking and looking through Ecclesiastes chapter six from the lens of an entrepreneur, from the lens of somebody that's not a pastor, from somebody that's just a lay person in a church. I'm just figuring out life just as many as you are too as well. But I also want to understand the biblical impact of what the Bible says about the pursuit of wealth, prosperity, happiness, joy, legacy. I want to know what it's all about. And guess what financial book I found that gives me the greatest insight in doing that? No, it's not Rich Dad, Poor Dad. No, it's not multiple streams of income. No, it's not missed fortune. No, and it's not all the top selling books that you might see regularly, Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman, anything like that on the, on the shelf. I found one reference manual. It's called the Bible. More specifically, the chapters and books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Now, keep this in mind. King Solomon, who took over reign between 20 and 21 years old, instead of asking God for riches, instead of asking God for wealth, uh, prosperity, uh, armies, territories, land, etc., etc., he asked God for one thing. He said, Lord, give me wisdom. And God was so impressed. He says, you know what? Not only will I give you what you asked for, but I'm going to give you everything you didn't ask for. And to make a long story short, as we unpacked that already in the Proverbs series, that for 40 years, King Solomon led Israel through a 40-year golden age of exactly just that, of wealth, prosperity, and happiness and enjoyment. But now, at the end stages of his life, he's not finishing well. Why? Because he fell into idolatry. He fell into marrying women of different gods and different religions and differences that led him away from his first love. His first promise was to follow God, Elohim, the great I am, the one God. And now King Solomon is wealthy. He's got everything going on. Now he's going out there marrying different women. Listen, in the Bible it even says that King Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines, <laughs> 1,000 women, goodness gracious probably thousands and thousands of children. And now in Ecclesiastes, he's reflecting and looking back and says, all that stuff is meaningless. And I'm reading this, I'm having a hard time doing this because I'm a father, I'm running a business, I'm managing my finances, I'm investing, I'm saving, I'm reinvesting back into business and giving to charitable contributions. And to see all this stuff is now meaningless? Why? Let's read here in Ecclesiastes chapter six, verse one and two. Here's what it says. I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor, so that they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. And now people in the church are reading this, and the Bible says, ah, man, I figured it out. What you're going for is useless. What you're going for is meaningless. Who cares if you're building a business? Who cares if you're living in that neighborhood and expanding your offices across the country? It's all, all meaningless, right? Well, my opinion, wrong. If all you were doing was the pursuit of money, status, recognition, just for you, then you're right. That is the sin. That is meaningless. But keep this in mind. There's so many other people that King Solomon blessed because of his obedience, because of his calling. And there's so many people out there that you will bless in your obedience, in your calling, with between you and God. Not between the seven fear squad and you and God. No, it's between you and God. I've got nothing to do with it. But if God has given you a vision, God has given you a dream, just like he spoke in King Solomon's dreams, and God has given you something special, let me give you a newsflash. Nobody else is supposed to understand it. That's between you and God. God gave you a dream that specifically is meant for your purpose, why he designed you to be who you are. Now, regardless if you're an entrepreneur, regardless if you have some form of talent, some form of celebrity status, or you're just a janitor in a school, you have purpose. Everybody has an importance. God doesn't create mistakes. Your life has meaning. But what is it that you're pursuing? If it's just supposed to be 
beat on your chest. And I'm the man. I'm the king of the mountain. I'm this, I'm that. I got these girls and this business and this money. And you're just flaunting. Yeah, I agree. It is meaningless. It's all for what? For you? Because when much is given, much is expected. But let me give you some data. I'm a facts guy. There's too much evidence in the Bible that God wants you to be broke. That you're no more blessed because you have no money and you're living paycheck to paycheck. You're not any more blessed because you're in that situation versus the guy that is fighting you free and the gal that is running a business. You're no more blessed than them. There's too much evidence. Here it is. Did you know that there are roughly 2,350 verses concerning money in the Bible? That's almost twice as many as verses about faith and prayer combined. Jesus had a lot to say about money. Nearly 15% of everything Jesus spoke about related to money and possessions. 16 out of his 38 parables dealt with the topic of money. The only subject Jesus taught more about than money was the kingdom of God and love. Now, I would challenge the church, I would challenge anybody in the church to use this chapter of the scripture as justification for you not to pursue your financial freedom, your goals, and your ambitions. I would say though, however, what are you doing it for? Just keep this in mind. You, at the end of the day, are a steward, meaning that everything that you have has been given. It all didn't come from you. It came from the big man upstairs. He said, I want to trust my daughter. I want to trust my son with his career, with this job, with this job interview, with this 50 bucks, with this 50,000 bucks, with this credit score, with this scenario, the situation, this marriage, the divorce. God is testing you. So therefore you can go earn it, not get it for free. God wants you to earn it. And we live in a society today where people don't want to earn it. So if that's you, please put in the comment section below, I am earning it. Put in the comment section below, which leads me to my next point. So if you want to earn it, well, guess what you got to find? It's more than just finding a job. It's more than just starting a business. It's more than just starting to tuck away 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks, doing a 401k rollover, et cetera, et cetera. My encouragement to you is to find your purpose and contribution back to this world, back to society, based on the God-given opportunities and principles and dream that he's given you. Martin Luther King once said, most men die at 25. They just get buried at 65. Henry David Thoreau, he also said, that most men live lives of quiet desperation. King Solomon is in a situation right now, writing Ecclesiastes so far for the first six chapters of this, of this uh, book of the Bible, that I'm seeing that he's in a massively reflective moment at the end stages of his life. He's seeing this kingdom that he built starting to collapse. There's people warring behind him. There's people conspiring behind him. There's people stealing behind him. There's people trying to gain power behind him. And he's looking at his life. He's looking now that God is now losing. He's lost favor with God. And he's seeing his kingdom just crumble. He's seeing his children being divided. And keep this in mind. He is the richest and wisest king who ever lived. And it's, this is all crumbling all before him. And I sense from reading his books here, the first six chapters of Ecclesiastes, I'm sensing, I don't know if you, you do it too as well, but I'm sensing that he's a bit of a blame game. He's in a deeply reflective, cynical moment writing thus far the first six chapters of Ecclesiastes. And I don't know how else the other chapters are going to be, what you and I are going to find out here over the next several weeks. But what I'm sitting like, trying to understand what King Solomon is doing and what he's going through. I've been through that. I've been through a marriage. I've been through a divorce. I've been through a bankruptcy. I've been through health challenges. I've seen what I've built through my little career in serving the United States Marine Corps and the little career I have building insurance practice and now building insurance business. I've seen many things not go my way. I've had victimization myself of using the wrong language, blame, entitlement, you know, helplessness. And yet God has given us the power. Deuteronomy 8.18 it says God has given us the power to create wealth. I see that as God's words of promise to as well. Now King Solomon, he's just a man too as well. Yeah, he's a king, but also seeing the scriptures here being played out is deeply cynical, reflective, blame game type of language that he's using. But keep this in mind. This is what he said in Proverbs at the beginning of his reign. The first chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs 1, this is what he said. Gain wisdom and instruction for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction 
is prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. It seems to me he's no longer tapping into that gain wisdom and understanding type mantra. He's like, woe is me. It's all meaningless. Da, 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 da. Uh, okay, I get it. But I'm also seeing the wisdom inside his words too as well. Because if you're out there thinking that just because you're trying to get a million followers on whatever social media platform, you're looking for likes and clicks and comments and engagement on social media, and you think that validates you? It doesn't validate you. You try to please people here on earth and people that could care less about you, you're looking for those people to validate you. I agree, King Solomon, that is meaningless. But if you're using your career, you're using your social media platform, using whatever it is that you're involved, community involvement to bless others, which is what God wants you to do. God's commandment through Jesus said, love your neighbor, love God, lean not on your own understanding, trust and acknowledge me and he will make your path straight. These are all scriptures in the Bible I'm putting, piecing all together. It's not this meaningless conversation. Now let's flip to Ecclesiastes verse three. Here's what he says about achieving all that. Let's take a look at this. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning. It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice over but fails to enjoy his prosperity, does not all go to the same place? Listen, at the end of the day, when you pass away, somebody else is gonna enjoy your car. Somebody else is gonna enjoy your watch. Somebody else is gonna enjoy your house. Somebody's gonna also enjoy your last name. Now, what type of last name would you like to birth forward, starting with you? Like I've always said, be that generation that makes a decisive decision to plant your financial flag in our ground. Because one man's obedience in any generation can change that bloodline forever it could be you it's definitely for king solomon because keep this in mind as much as king solomon is going through all this riffraff through this bloodline of king david his father now king solomon and then through from adam and eve through abraham 42 generations what happened jesus was born by the way let's take a look at this i'm excited to see how god can use you he can use me he can use us if we are aligned to god's purpose and contribution let's take a look at real quick at this chart that shows the bloodline of Jesus. You've got Adam, you've got Noah, you've got Abraham, King David, and of course King David's son was Solomon. You see it right there, Solomon, Robam, Abamajah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joram, on down to Jesus Christ. And by the way, the irony of all these names, if you read these names in the Bible, there was incest, there was anger, there was murder, there's these things, all these crazy characters in the Bible who the last thing you think would be through the blood that God trusted through that bloodline would become our savior. The irony of all that, so no matter what situation that you're going through, I don't care if you're perfect, God ain't looking for perfection. What he is looking for is obedience, to find your purpose, to find that God-given direction and contribution he has created you to fulfill. I once read a book called God Wants You to Be Rich, written by a Christian economist named Paul Zane Pilzer. And I'm paraphrasing one of his chapters, but he basically says in there, to not trust God in your pursuit of creating wealth and investing and saving your money and giving tithes and offerings from your money, even though you may have not have money to make ends meet, that's like saying, I don't trust God for this provision. I trust God for this little bit, but I don't trust God for this a lot of it. And that is the meaninglessness of life because the great truth of my pursuit, and I've experienced it myself, that when I wholeheartedly trust God, and I'm obviously I'm still working, I'm not a model to follow this, because I'm still working on it, I'm just a mere man. But for some of you, what's your level of trusting God? When you pick up the phone, you're in business, you're calling prospects, you're going out there finding clients, you're dealing with clients that uh, asked for a refund, your employees quit, your wife leaves, your husband leaves, your kids are rebelling towards you. What do you do in that moment? Oh my gosh, what a helpless feeling sometimes. I've been there. Like, Lord, can I have a win today? Because everything's just lost. I lost my business, I lost at home, I lost my finances, I lost my customers, nobody trusts me, nobody's engaging me with my social media content. That, that, all those things just pile up against you. You don't think you have a win. But in that moment, it was when you just say, God, I trust you. God, show up. 
God, I need you. God, I'm willing to do what it takes. In that moment, people have a hard time letting their pride and ego down. And that's when you should have your spiritual muscle get strengthened and say, oh God, spout through it, laugh through it, cry, happy, through it. And all that process, trust God in that. And I'm not sure if King Solomon here, reading Ecclesiastes thus far, is doing much of that. And by the way, I cannot wait to go into heaven and have an interview with King Solomon. He's one of my heroes of the Bible. I want to know what phase he was going through. I want to know what his mindset was to be able to write this type of book. I mean, Proverbs was like an aspiring book. And Ecclesiastes thus far through the first six chapters is kind of letting me down, but I'm seeing the wisdom behind it. I'm seeing the, the A-B testing of life through it. See, at this phase of King Solomon, eventually he's going to be put in the ground. Eventually you and I will be put in the ground. And when they put you in the ground, and they put a tombstone above where you're buried, there's two dates on that tombstone. One date will be the year you were born. The other date will be the date you passed away and buried you in the ground. In the middle is a dash. Here's what the dash represents. The dash represents every good and bad decision you made. Your good and bad moments. Your deepest times of happiness and deepest times of sadness. It represents your family your spouse, your kids, your legacy. What will that dash say about you? I pray and hope that that dash is not meaningless. That your life meant something and something significant. I remember watching the movie Saving Private Ryan. At the end scene, he's there at the cemetery. He's there with his wife. He's there with his kids, his grandkids there in the back. If you watch the movie Saving Private Ryan, Six soldiers went out to find the last Ryan of three brothers. Two of brothers had already passed away in combat in World War II. And so the president said, we need to rescue the last Ryan because otherwise we're going to kill off an entire bloodline. But yet six men, six soldiers lost their life to save Private Ryan, to bring him back home to America, to bring him back home to his mother. So therefore he can have a wife, he can have a kid. And the last words in that movie that Captain played by Tom Hanks, before he passed away, he says, earn it, earn it. And you reflect back to the cemetery, he looks at the graves, six men, the six soldiers that died to save his life, for him to come back home to America, to save the Ryan last name and legacy with his wife and his kids, and his grandkids right there. He turns to his wife, he looks at her very intently, he says, tell me I lived a good life, tell me I'm a good man. And she looks at him and she says, you are. And I hope that you have that moment with your family, that your deathbed, that when they're burying you in the ground and you got thousands of people at your funeral because you lived a life of significance, of purpose, of contribution, it wasn't meaningless, that your life made a difference to other people and is more than just money, that people said you lived a good life, that you saved and you rescued people spiritually, financially, whatever that contribution is, that you're pursuing right now, that it is not without meaning. What does that dash say about you? Something to think about how your wife, your children, your family say about your life? Well, only between you and God can answer that. If you want to live a good life, please put in the comment section below. I will or I am living a good life. I'm interested about what you put in the comment section below. I am or I will live a good life. Put it in the comment section below. With that being said, appreciate you tuning into this episode. Please check out the other episodes we have here on both Proverbs and Ecclesiastes in this Wealth and Wisdom series launched every Sunday night at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time here on the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel. Please put your thoughts, your comments below. You agree with me? You don't agree with me? I'd love to know your feedback. With that being said, from Dallas, Texas, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.